Hey, welcome to the 159th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode was brought to you by patrons Hart Perez and James Scogan. I'm Matt Enlo. And I'm Warren Kaplan, and today we have Michael K. Feinstein and Nikki Suhu on the podcast. They have just made a movie called The Browsing Effect. Nikki acted in it. She also acted in my Verizon Go 90 series called Miss 2059. Yeah, it was a really good conversation. We talked to Michael about kind of the way he cast his people, the way he put together the movie, what he did as his process on set. And I found it to be really fascinating. And I feel like we cover some new territory that we've never covered before. But also, I think there are a bunch of ideas that I'm going to steal. Yeah. Like, the start day gift, giving your actors a gift on day one uh, just to make sure that they're excited to be there and realize that they're appreciated. Yeah, you know, I think we talk a lot about scope and the ways that you can add scope to your project. And Michael's got a really smart one. And it's basically just if the idea of his film is that apps, basically online dating has opened up the world of dating to people and that world is vast now, then your cast needs to be vast. And he has some really creative and smart and insightful ways to do that. And as a result, his movie felt big, even though it was made on a small budget. So we go in pretty deep with him. It's a great conversation. I think he's a really interesting and unique filmmaker. Um, and also it's wonderful to have Nikki, one of his leads on the show as well, because I think she adds that additional layer of understanding as an actor who's been in plenty of big Hollywood productions she knows what it's like to be at big big budget projects but also in smaller budget projects and she kind of helps relay what she likes the best and she, what she wishes things were improved upon in indie budget filmmaking yeah it's really cool to talk to both of them and you will hear us talk to both of them as soon as we finish telling you about our patreon page mm-hmm Matt, tell me, what the heck is Patreon? So Patreon, for those of you who are just now tuning in, Patreon is when you subscribe a small amount of money on a recurring basis to help support the show. So say a buck or four or five or 20, basically once a month, that will accumulate towards us paying our editor Jay, buying new equipment, contributing to the alcohol fund that the, our guests consume we had catering you might call it you know we always like to take care of our guests like any indie filmmaker knows it's important to keep people um fed and watered and so uh you know we spend a lot of money on all of that stuff and so your contributions help keep um, our guests in wine and chocolate so to find out more go to patreon.com slash just shoot it pod and without any further ado let's talk to michael and nikki Michael K. Feinstein and Nikki Suhu. Hi. Hi. Well, Welcome. Thanks for having us. From the browsing effect. Woo yeah. woo. <laughs> Where are you coming from? Santa Monica. Oh, boy. Ooh. That's a drive. That's a oh, commitment. Oh, you're telling me. Yeah. See, that's how much I wanted to be here, guys. Sure, there you go. And you didn't even know that I was... I know. <laughs> ...that I was involved in this. I didn't. I didn't. What a happy surprise. So, to clue listeners in, uh, Nikki and Oren worked together on Miss 2059 back in the day. Yeah. Um, you played Anna's twin sister i did yeah badass that saves the world sort of yeah except i think she saved the <laughs> yeah, world Yeah, okay but i was training to save the world but you told her you are gonna save right the world. i'm the one that empowered her to do it yeah you gave her permission thank you well what uh <laughs> so in the browsing effect what what do you do so in the browsing effect i play rachel who is a recently single woman now Entering the world of online dating and experiencing it to the fullest, might I say. Cool. Can you give us the logline for The Browsing Effect, Michael? Uh, yeah. It's a story about a group of friends living in Los Angeles, but they really could be anywhere. And just kind of how, you know, the internet and these apps, uh, both social media like Instagram and Facebook and also kind of dating apps like Tinder and Hinge and Bumble, how it affects their relationships, both their romantic relationships and also their friendships and kind of examining how the internet has kind of exacerbated a lot of feelings that we've always had as human beings, including, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. Yeah, and it's um, available. And it's going to be available, well, I think by the time this is out, it'll be available um, digital on demand. So pretty much anywhere you can rent and buy movies, it'll be available. iTunes, Amazon, Vudu, Comcast on demand, you know, I, anywhere, anywhere you can think it'll be there. 
Awesome. Well, congrats, man. Thank you. Is this story based on a personal story? Um, you know, the, the overall story, which is kind of about uh, two couples, and uh, one couple at the beginning of the movie gets engaged, and the other couple, which has just broken up, That's they, kind of, uh, <laughs> they kind of freak out about the engagement. They start thinking, oh, look, our friends, um, look at their relationship is so mature. They're getting married. They're moving on to the next stage of adulthood. What are we doing with our lives? And so they start, um, you know, using these apps to date and meet a lot of new people. And, of course, they go back and they tell their friends uh, who have just gotten engaged about all their escapades. And it makes their friends think, oh, maybe we got engaged too soon. You know, maybe we're not living our, uh, you know, our younger years to the fullest. And it's kind of that back and forth of how what we do in our lives affects the decisions of our friends. Um, that wasn't really based on anything specifically, uh, but some of the individual story points within the kind of uh, broader uh, arc are definitely things that were inspired by uh, my experiences and the experiences of my friends. And sometimes that's just kind of a, a thematic similarity. And then sometimes there are things in the movie that like literally happened to me verbatim. Yeah, actually, when I was shooting the film, I had never experienced online dating at all. I was in a long-term relationship, and... Wait, so you're, you're not in that long-term relationship I'm anymore? not, no. Um, we, that was the one you were in during yeah, this 2059. exactly. Um, yeah, it was a five-year long relationship, and we started dating before online dating was a thing, and... Basically, I was getting older, and I was like, man, we got to break up because I'm getting older, and we don't actually have the same life goals. This person sucks. Yeah. Oh, no, but he's <laughs> like I'm my teasing. best I'm, friend. I'm, I love I'm him. purely joking. <laughs> it's a very mature and adult thing for yeah. you to say. So I'm like, <laughs> okay. I mean, it took us like over a year to actually break up, uh, even though sure. we had the intention of breaking up sooner. Um, I know, Michael and I, we disagree on, on, the, on being friends with our exes. Mm. Um, but yeah, so now, here I am. And the movie's coming out, and I am in the world of online dating now. So wait, I wait. So you didn't break up until after you dropped the movie, right? So you right. don't oh. even get the benefit of this new experience. Well, the great part was that I was playing this character that was living um, this kind of crazy life of right. online dating that I wasn't actually experiencing in sure, real sure. life. Like, so yeah, was, maybe this sounds good to me. Yeah, it was kind of cool to play this uh, something that I wasn't actually living, but now I'm actually living it. And then I'm referencing back to the movie and being like, oh yeah, that does happen. Uh, <laughs> this is this is really how it works. Okay. <laughs> What's one of those things that does happen? Um, just like there's this one scene uh, where Ben is texting with this girl and they're having a great conversation and then all of a sudden she just kind of stops talking in the middle of the conversation. But that happens all the time because people are using the app kind of right. just like, to feel fill time. And as soon as they have something more important to do, they're off. I mean, I'm guilty of it myself. Um, but yeah, it's really awkward to have a conversation. You're like in the middle of it and all of a sudden they're just gone. And then they come back a couple of days later. They're like, sorry, I was doing this. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Matt and I both got married pre-Tinder. Yeah, pre-internet practice. So all we know about that world is what we see in movies. Yeah, and I think, you know, for people, you know, like you guys, old, married, <laughs> people. Happy, yes. happy, happy people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this movie will be exciting. Um, and, you know, and I think it, it gives you kind of a key in to experiences that, you kind of see in your periphery but then i think also it will kind of highlight this idea that uh, the feelings around it mm -hmm. are the same are as, universal as, yeah. yeah they're universal yeah, yeah. and the same you know people are still anxious when they're mm -hmm. dating and so this is your first movie michael this right? is my first feature film yeah and uh so what does that mean that you made like a million shorts i made uh i wrote and directed three shorts and then i wrote some other shorts that some film school buddies directed themselves and I uh, I wrote a play that was in Chicago, and I wrote a web series for MTV, and just you know a lot oh, of wow. smaller kind of stuff, stuff. Yeah. you know, just hopefully honing my craft so that you know I felt a bit secure, mm -hmm. you know, as secure as you can feel making a micro budget short feature film. You, um, what film school did you go to? Uh, I went to NYU Tisch, but I should say that I wasn't in the film production program i was in the dramatic writing program so it was uh, mm, a writing cool. intensive program and uh, that's perfect to have film buddies who can then go shoot your movies yes yeah, cool. it was and you know i ended up 
befriending mostly people in the production program. And then I would kind of watch them make their shorts and I would be jealous because I had all these scripts, but, you know, no production um, department behind me. So one summer before my senior year of college, I just uh, I spent what was left over from my bar mitzvah fund and I shot my first short film, which was entirely an NYU uh, crew, Mm -hmm. but did not have the school at our back or anything like that. Like you didn't get hooked up with free. Everything. No, I didn't. Did you know <laughs> NYU is is great in a lot of ways, um, but one way the Tisch School is lacking is they they don't encourage you know interdepartment uh, mingling. Synergy. <laughs> yeah, you know you would think it's so obvious. Oh, the kids in the acting program can be in the sure. movies of the directing program and using the script of, but it just doesn't happen. Yeah, uh, I you know I remember as a student I would it would frustrate me then. And I would ask around, and it seemed like it had a lot to do with kind of department rivalries and mm-hmm. uh, amongst the professors, not the students. Yeah, that makes complete sense, right? Yeah. Like everyone's, it's all egos, right? Yeah, a lot of egos in yeah. film school. It's yeah. funny how um, in film school you spend, you know, four years writing and directing your own stuff. And then that happens a little bit outside of school, but relatively quickly, you're just like directing something someone else wrote, you know? Um yeah, have you ever directed anything someone else wrote? No, I don't think so. I guess so. you come it's more from the writing fun. side. <laughs> what is that? Because you come from the writing side, obviously. Yeah, I, I I see myself primarily as a writer, and you know there are certain things that are you know kind of tonally very close to the vest and what I'm trying to do, and I I couldn't imagine someone else directing them. And then there are things that I write that you know I'm just kind of taking a bigger swing at uh, a genre or an idea that isn't necessarily personal but i just think would be a cool movie and in those cases i'm i'm happy to part with the script you know and have you been like hired to write stuff i mean i'm assuming the mtv thing yeah so i was hired by mtv other which was their internet wing what was your series at mtv other um it was called shortcomings uh i made it with uh, my friend also a peer from nyu daniel jaffe and it was kind of a teen comedy um about a kid who um, breaks his right arm and he goes to the doctor and the doctor tells him you know the arm will be better in a handful of months but because he's unable to masturbate using his arm there's a a build-up and if he doesn't use it he's going to lose it so it's kind of a a quirky slightly surreal (laughs) uh take on uh you know the sex comedies right that's funny. And it was an MTV digital series. Yes, it was. Cool. Um, it's still available on the internet somewhere if you oh, awesome. YouTube it. Short there Cummings. forever, yeah. We'll have to dig it out. C-O-M-I-N-G-S? Hmm? How do you spell it? Cummings? Oh, C-O-M-M-I-N-G-S. So short Cummings. Yeah. It's funny. Well, so this movie, The Browsing Effect, it's like a dating movie, micro-budget, your first film... I feel like, you know, you hear about this type of movie a lot, but you have this like incredible cast and you have Gravitas Pictures, you have great PR company behind you. How did you, how did you put, get all the, like what differentiates your project from all these other projects? Like how'd you get there? You know, I think one thing that differentiated us is that from, you know, the get go, I had people behind me who, who cared. Um, and I think that's really important. What uh, sort of people? What do you so, mean? you know, I wrote, I wrote a script. Uh, I wrote this script in mind for me to direct. So I'm thinking about the budget as I write it. Okay, no set pieces. What's something that is doable? Something that is in my wheelhouse, but also isn't going to break the bank. And that will be a showcase for what it is I'm trying to do, which I feel like is kind of a tonal blend between comedy and drama, you know, kind of a, a melancholic comedy so i wrote this script and the first thing i did was i sent it to two friends of mine from nyu who were in the film program who uh since graduating had been doing producing uh mostly for commercials and branded content and maybe a little lower down the ladder production coordinator etc uh but really talented guys and uh, rowan bibby and paul perez and they read it and they really dug it and they were on my side from day one. And just having those people there made all the difference because... Were they producers? Yeah. So they okay. came on as producers 
And, you know, just I think when it's a one man band, it's tough to constantly like validate yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the thing that I should be doing. Yes, this is worth my time. Uh, You know, there's so many ways in your head for you to kind of uh, talk yourself out of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, So just having those people there who I trusted, who I knew were talented, saying to me, no, this this script is good. Mm -hmm. The script is worth putting our time into because it's it takes so long to get anything done, especially when you have no money. So if you don't have the fortitude to just continue on, you're going to give up partway. So I wrote this script, like I said, in mind to make, and I sent it to my uh, my buddies, Rowan and Paul, who came on as producers. And I reached out to my freshman year roommate at NYU, Mark Katz, who's a DP, a really talented um, cinematographer, and I asked him if he would read the script and if he'd be down to DP. And he had an Alexa camera. So at that point, I had two producers and I had a cinematographer with a camera. Then it became about raising money. I'm lucky in that or, you know, not you lucky. You had but, three bar mitzvahs. Yeah, I had three bar mitzvahs. You know, I, I, you know, I come from a privileged background where I know people whose parents have disposable income and one of whom uh, was someone who had been a supporter of mine for a while, who, when I made my first shorts, reached out to me to say, hey, I really like that, and I admire you for pursuing this passion of yours. Um, You know, and I kind of had that person and some other people in my head as, okay, one day when I have a script that I'm proud of and that I'm ready to move forward with, these would be people that... I would reach out to. And do you reach out to them with like a business plan? Or are you saying like, hey, invest in me as an artist? Or are you saying invest in the browsing effect as a business? So I sent them the script and Paul and Rowan had made up a very rough budget. I mean, granted, you know, none of us had made a feature before. So a lot of it was guesswork. Nikki Suhu, $1 million. That's right. <laughs> you know, stuff stuff around that, uh, around those uh, estimates. But, you know, so we sent them stuff. You know, that made it seem, it wasn't just like an idea. It was, okay, we have a script and we have an amount and here's how I think I can do it. You're showing their sh- that you're serious. Yeah. Can you give us a ballpark for what that amount is? And you can say no. Yeah, sure. Um, so I got, at the time, what, what was half the budget from this first investor, which was uh, $60,000. Uh, from him. And was it contingent on getting the other half? Like, where, did you ever go like, okay, well, if we don't get the rest, we'll just make the movie for this amount of money? We didn't really allow ourselves to think that way. After we got half the funds, it kind of convinced us that we could do it. And more importantly, it convinced other people because we were no longer saying, hey, we need your money to make this movie. What we were saying was, we're making a movie. Right. It's get happening regardless. We'd love it if you would be a part of it, but we don't need you. And I think, you know, I think that was easier for, for people to, to swallow. Okay, they already have half their money. You know, no one wants to be the first person to put uh, their money in. So once we got this, you know, this first big push, the rest of it was easier. And, you know, I could go to other friends and I could go to, to family. And I was able to raise what was initially $120,000 and then balloon to a little bit more. I think at the end of the day, our budget comes out to... A little less than 200 grand and that's just hard cash i mean there's so many favors that went into this movie this is not a two hundred thousand dollar movie this is probably a closer to a million dollar movie because we got locations for free our cinematographer was bringing this camera that he would charge other people for there was so much stuff i'm dying to see the two hundred thousand dollar film that looks like a two hundred thousand dollar film that's yeah. not like <laughs> that has no favors no free locations <laughs> No, well, extras. look. I mean, the, the reality is, you just can't make that movie, right? No. Right. Well, yeah. it's, you could. You could um, it's small, it's like a it's DSLR. Small. Movie. I was able to make this movie with these funds because I come from this privileged background, and I know these people. You yeah, know, but was, you also it, didn't show up and say, "Okay, can I have money?" You're like, "No, Here's I, a I, I had, Here's, I had I did wrote this. my script. I had spent years writing this script. You went to NYU. You I went did to NYU. This MTV you know, show. It's not I like think, you're nobody. I think sometimes people are reluctant to kind of say, "Oh." my privileged helped me make this movie or get this right. done because 
they think it comes off as saying the only reason why I was able to make this thing was because I know rich people. And that's just simply not true. Uh, you know, it helped me get all the equipment mm -hmm. and the crew, but then everything after that, I had to rely on my talent and the talent of that crew and There of that There are plenty cat. of rich people who don't have movies. Yes. Right. It couldn't have happened without my particular skills and the skills of the cast and the crew, and it, couldn't, it also couldn't have happened without the privilege that I just was lucky enough to be born into. Yeah. Yeah, I, but also, you could move to L.A. and have, like, or go to NYU and just do all these various things without that privilege and eventually meet someone. Right. Oh, a hundred percent. And, you know, it just might take a little longer or just happen in a, on a different avenue. And everyone has, I mean, a lot of people have different types of privileges. There's not just one type of privilege. I mean, I moved out here and I, I'm from Rhode Island. I didn't know a single soul in LA. I had no uncle or, or whatever to get me that first job. I mean, and some people do, and that's a privilege. Or they went to a school with a small uh, film program, so then their alumni out here right. are much more able to help them out. You know, there's a, lots of different sure. privileges, yeah. and they help people in, in lots of different ways. My dad just gave me a tiny $1 million loan <laughs> when I started. <laughs> no, 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 but I, I think what Michael's getting at, and I think that we were talking about before, bef off mic, I think is really valuable and really important, because I think that when filmmakers don't acknowledge that privilege right and the circumstances whatever they may be right and, and that then gets really annoying i get so annoyed <laughs> because then you're on the podcast and then people listening from wherever they're listening from you're obviously you're comparing yourself with the guests on the show always right like you're a first-time filmmaker you want to be like i want to do what michael did i want to do the browsing effect and if you don't tell the whole picture then they don't have a complete comparison, right? Right. They're like, well, all I have to do is like get two buddies on and go right, make a movie. Right, exactly. Right? And and so saying like, oh, you were, you were fortunate enough to know some people who had disposable income just kind of paints that entire picture for them. And that means you can say, okay, I'm going to get crafty and specific in a different way. I'm going to shoot it on an iPhone or I'm going to... You know, there's a million. His mom was crafty. Nope. Yeah, my, my mom there did crafty. Just, hey. just in case you think that all, all the money went to crafty. And she did yeah. great. Yeah. She also, $200,000 is not a ton of money to no, make a I mean, with. It, you know? It's funny because. And is that your total budget or your production budget? That was our total budget. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's an amount that is at once a lot of money and almost $0 yeah. Yeah, yeah. at the same time. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I have a question, actually. Yeah. Um, because. Our whole film was SAG, right? Uh, yeah, I think it was two fifty under oh, two fifty okay. was ultra. I mean, yeah. So, so yeah. that ended up being one of the most <laughs> expensive parts of the movie. You know, when I was writing it, you know, and I was trying to account for the budget in the writing process, I never wanted the movie to feel small. Like even if there had no special effects, you know, since I was talking about online dating, which was such a big topic. And one that affects so many people and the point of online dating is suddenly the world is bigger. It it, it would make no sense people. to have yeah. a small world and just have yeah. two characters in a bedroom or a beach house, which often is the case where micro budgets are shot. So I thought, okay, if I have a large cast and even if the scenes are a lot of people talking in bedrooms or talking at bars, but it's a lot of different people having different types of conversations, then inherently the world will feel large if you're seeing 50 different faces on the screen. Yeah. Uh, so I wrote a script with like 30 different speaking roles. And in my head, because I didn't understand the SAG rules, I would just hire, you know, SAG actors for the top roles and then all the lower roles we were going to hire, you know, actors who would just do free work for their reel, you know, so they have footage for the reel. What we didn't realize was under SAG ultra low budget rules, everybody, whether they're SAG or not SAG, if they're an actor, has to get paid SAG minimum. Yeah, so the Taft Hartley them in. Right? Exactly. So I didn't realize that while writing it. So that ended up being. Wait, one of the most the expensive minimum? parts. 100 bucks a day? Uh, it's something in that area. I think it's a little more, like 116. Yeah. yeah. Like minimum wage. Minimum wage, yeah. 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 How, how many shoot days did you have? We had 19 shoot dates, and then we had reshoots like 
uh, we had two days of reshoots like nine months later. So ultra low budget is under 250. Yeah. So yeah. We Modified were, is under 700. Yeah. So we were SAG UOB. And yeah. So just paying all the actors was one of the biggest costs of the film. Because like I said, we have um, 30 speaking roles. So we cast a bunch. So since we knew we were going to have to pay anyway, we ended up getting a lot of SAG actors, which, you know, I think is one thing that differentiates the film from a lot of other movies where we have really good actors. It's a really talented ensemble. It's not like, oh, that person's clearly just starting out. There's a lot of really talented actors in our film, which I think separates it. What would you attribute to being able to get those actors? Like, I'll tell you my opinion of why I chose to do it, but I want to know what your approach was. You know, I think it's helpful that I wrote the script and that I had a strong idea about certain aspects of these characters and then other aspects of them, I had an open mind. So there wasn't exactly one person that could play all these roles and yet I still had a sense of who could or couldn't. So we had a great casting director, Susan Deming. Oh, um, yeah. Good old Susan. Susan. Yeah, sure. Susan. Yeah. Yeah. Shout she's, out Susan Deming. She's fantastic. And, you know, she saw probably a thousand self-tapes because yes. we had so many different roles. Uh, and then she sent us hundreds of self-tapes. And then from those hundreds of self-tapes, we asked to see, was it, did you, you know, self-tape? No. So Nikki was the last. Nikki's role, Nikki's Rachel, one was of the Susan's last role. So we had, <laughs> she's. <laughs> so we had six lead roles in the ensemble, and it was important to me that at least half of those roles were for people of color. It ended up being four of six, but while we were casting, it was important that at least half. So I knew that as we were going through the casting process, and we were casting other roles, and people were starting to go into their their slots. The Rachel role, I knew I wanted it to either be, you know, an African American actress or an Asian actress or um, a Latina actress, S- someone who would bring kind of a different flavor to things. So we started narrowing down the search at that point, and we were seeing tons and tons of people. And the Rachel role that Nikki plays so well, I don't make it easy for you to like her. You know, I have her say things that are kind of flippant. I have her act in certain ways where she seems to disregard consequences like a real three-dimensional person, but not one that I make it super easy to like. So I needed an actress who could play that and play it authentically, and then I felt that you could still understand her and you would still like her and want to root for her. And that was it proved to be a very difficult thing to find someone who could kind of say something bitchy to their best friend and you as an audience member kind of be behind it in this way. So we saw a lot of people and I just kind of had an idea of tone. I come back to tone a lot because tone can be specific and it can be vague. It can be general. And I had an idea of tone and it wasn't till Nikki came in that I was like, this is a person that can deliver this tone. Is there any way you can describe that tone? You know, it's... I think we we know all of us know a Rachel. It's someone who tries so hard to achieve something in spite of everything else. Someone who you know seems like they have it all together, but probably doesn't. It had to be familiar, but I wanted her to bug you a little bit, and I wanted you to root for her too. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know the funny thing about it actually is. That I felt like was one of my worst auditions that I had had in a while. Like I I literally came in, they called my name. I hadn't even had my shoes on. Like I brought heels to wear and I wasn't ready. My I felt like my shirt was untucked. And then I got in there and I was so flustered already that when we started writing the lines, I kept getting them wrong. And it was so frustrating for me because I knew them outside of the room. And so then inside of the room, I'm like, no, please let me do it again. <laughs> you know, and I'm... I'm Wait, how long was the scene that you were auditioning with? Oh, gosh, I don't even remember anymore. I just remember I felt like a hot mess. And I felt really disappointed because I really enjoyed the role. And uh, yeah, I just felt like I did a really horrible job. So when I got cast, I was so surprised. And I actually asked Michael why he cast me. And he's like, I was like, I just felt like such a hot mess. And he was like, no, 
you are perfect. That's exactly who the character was. You know, I think <laughs> I think some people when they some actors when they came in and they were maybe not as prepared as they wanted to be, they kind of were a little meek about it or oh, I'm bashful. I'm sorry. You know, Nikki wasn't that way. I mean, it, you know, she was, you know, kind of kicking herself and but also, I mean, she was you were kind of confident in your indignance like was i can't like, believe and she, I, I knew i got wait, i knew I were you like it. cutting like do you ever have like actors or like uh, get, let me let me take that over that was probably me actually yeah, sometimes yeah. i'm I like think. i'm like we can start that over yeah um, yeah yeah i i would rather especially if it's early on i'd rather have an actor just say let me take that again than like try to like suffer through. through it, push through. Yeah, because yeah. you never really pick it back up. Yeah, you know, you always have it in the back of your head that the start of the right. scene sucked, and you're just. Ugh. And sometimes you have to send that tape to somebody else. So exactly. like, if there's a flub up top, it's really hard to sell it to a producer or a client. Or oh something yeah, like when that. I, yeah. I mean, I was on a show uh, last year, and I was watching the creator mm-hmm. um, watch self tapes while we were at lunch. What's that? Well, I don't want to call it out just in case I'm I'm giving uh, you the dirt. So, so, oh, okay. so one time. So <laughs> I was on the show watching the creator look through self-tape auditions and literally within five seconds, he'd be like, nope. And the guy I didn't even start talking yet. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh my God, you yeah, know yeah. how many hours I put into self-tapes? Yeah, we're and- married to actors and we're fucking nightmares. <laughs> yeah. No, it was but- kind of disappointing, yeah. but it is about the tone, yeah. the vibe that yeah. that person gives off within those first five seconds. It means yeah. a lot. Yeah, and you know, I knew we had so many pages to shoot a day. Like we knew that, that that was going to be a hurdle. Are, I think, you know, there were certain days where we did seven, eight, yeah. nine pages. You know, the one scene, which is the party scene, which we accommodate for the 11 pages that we shoot by having a one but mm-hmm. still was a... Sure. Which <laughs> which never makes it any faster. Right? Yeah, no. <laughs> it just makes you more stressed because you're, you're like, talking. I can't cut anything. 100%. But because I knew that, and, you know, I knew that I wouldn't have time to really help actors find the characters on set. And we also didn't have a ton of money to pay for lots of rehearsals. I think each of the main actors got one or two days of rehearsal. So I wanted to cast people who were already there. You know, I, you know, the movie is about contemporary young people, and I'm casting young people. So I knew that it was within my limits to find people who could relate to each of these characters. And I, you know, I think a lot of the strength of the ensemble comes from the fact that we found people who day one and auditions related to the character and that while we were on set it was just kind of small adjustments that i was making oh could you deliver this line uh like you're like you're angry at this person or deliver it like you know you just got some depressing news right before this scene it wasn't big deep all right i want you to think about where this character comes from and Tell me about a time when your yeah, mother I mean, they, said something they hurtful. Sh- they to you. share these motivations, and you know, Nikki might not have, you know, been single at the time or relate to the, you know, circumstantial, superficial aspects of the character, but she connected with who she was deep down, and I knew that that would make my job as a director a lot easier. Nikki, why um, why did you say yes? Yeah, you know, honestly, when I when I read the script, I very <sighs> much connected with this character and I really liked that I was being asked to come in even though it wasn't specifically an Asian role. Um, I The character is written Jewish and so he writes in there that I was adopted into a Jewish family and was more Jewish than my Jewish boyfriend and I like that. I like that it was just a person that I got to play and it had no reference to my background or my culture. It could have been anyone and I got to play it and it was a lead character. Um, plus she was this personality that I don't get to be that often, which is a little bit more risk taking, I guess. Um, but I did, like Michael is saying, I did relate a lot to this high achieving feeling of a, of a person that continuously is on this quest to have more to be get more of this thing that you almost don't even know what it is that you're trying to shoot for you just know you need more of it besides the character itself which I really connected to 
I thought that the team behind it was very professional. They had sent out a pitch deck um, that had broken down like how it was going to be shot. And I knew that they were students or like that they had just graduated, which usually kind of makes me a little iffy about it because I know, oh gosh, it's going to be low budget. They're students. They don't have probably that much experience. I know I've been on sets like that before and it can be really um, tedious and hard a hard situation to put yourself in for a hundred dollars a day or whatever it is. It's, it's basically not much. Sure. Yeah. You're basically Uh, (laughs) breaking even. Right. right. I mean, if you're going to take a project like that, you're doing it because you like the work and that you want to be a part of this. And honestly, I felt that they were so professional in the way that they handled the whole situation, starting from casting to the table read, like having printed out scripts with highlighters. Did they send the, a pitch deck before you got cast or I feel like I saw it when, like when a, I was auditioning for it you might have seen the EPK oh then. maybe that's what it's called but we I had a know. pitch deck I mean you know we especially Rowan and Paul they had been on sets you know as the assistant director or production manager or whatever of sets that were crazy where no one was organized where it gave a bad name to you know people who were just out of film school and it, it was a very deliberate choice by us to not give anyone the opportunity to say oh these guys are in over their head these guys are naive these guys don't know what they're doing I mean we we really tried to be professional and you know even though this was our first film and we certainly didn't hide that from anybody you know we tried to you know make it seem like we've been here before yeah but I remember even telling you at that first table read I was like this is gonna be great like this project is gonna go really well because I mean they even had um like start gifts for us Mm -hmm. on that first day what was what were the start gifts they were little (laughs) notebooks and they hand wrote uh a letter to each of us like thanking us for for doing the project and telling us like or in mind they were like you know your your role was the hardest to cast and we're so happy we found you and it was very meaningful to me. Yeah, that's a classy move. Yeah. Nice. Wait, everyone you know, or just you wrote that? Just Michael wrote that? Yeah, I wrote, I wrote that. I wrote that. I wrote the letters. I mean, you know, what, like what I said at the beginning, it's so important to have people who believe in your project because your own belief in yourself isn't going to get you across the finish line. So every step of the way when I had more people come on, whether it was – you know, my amazing assistant director or uh, the production designer or the fact that my friend from high school flew across the country to be the prop master or that an actress like Nikki, who's been in big Hollywood movies, would would take on my first feature. It means a lot. And, you know, I think some people can play cool and pretend like, oh, it doesn't mean anything. But people like to know that it, things it? mean something. Yeah. And, you know, I constantly let people know how much it meant to me that they were here, that they were taking a chance on me. Wait, so how many letters did you write for day one? I think I think it was just uh, maybe seven or like eight. Like the main letters. cast. I mean, yeah, maybe seven, seven or eight Did letters. you write your DP letters? I wanted letters? you to say 30. <laughs> so it was, so, so I, wrote, I wrote the letters, um, and they actually weren't handwritten. Paul, my producer, who's very... Um, into his typewriter. He he typed it up on kind of nice uh, parchment. Gotcha. He stayed up late all night doing it. Um, so it, it looked it looked very nice. Yeah. That's cool. And then I believe we also gave them a, a thumb drive with uh, movies that were inspirations for the film so that they could kind of check it out movie like. Yeah, and there was just so much thought and care that went into that that it felt really good to be a part of a project. And, you know, ultimately when I look at at um, creators like that, I know that they're going to be successful and they're going to grow in this industry. And I'm lucky to have been a part of one of their first projects. That's how I see it. Wait, so did you watch all the movies? The I, I, movies? I I feel like I did, but I'm really good at watching movies and completely forgetting them. So sure. I'm like the best uh, movie, movie watcher. I can be scared by an ending that I've already seen happen and completely forget that it had happened. And for, and for those curious, um, it was uh, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, the 1969 Paul Mazursky film. That was a big influence on me. Also, um, Metropolitan, the Whit Stillman film, 
uh, Francis Ha, Noah Baumbach film, An Unmarried Woman, which is another Mazursky film. Uh, those were the, the type of films on. Yeah. On That's the, cool. On the and did you tell people like what you're like, just watch this movie? No, I, I kind of let them know that, oh, you know, this is what I feel like I took from mm-hmm. this film. This is this is this the is tone like or, yeah. that I'm trying to go for. This is. Uh, you know, this character right here is, is, you know, is the spiritual grandmother of this character, you know, stuff like that Mm -hmm. to let them give them a cue into it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And also I think what a great takeaway too, because like, it's not like you're spending a ton of money. It's all about the effort, um, and just showing actors that you care. I think that's a really awesome, uh, tool. I hope people, uh, take home with them. I hope I remember too as well. Yeah, um, I've never, I don't think I've ever given a start gift. Start gift, yeah. So I mean, classy. I've maybe said like, hey, let's, she doesn't play for like the first four scenes. Let's give her a later call time. It's probably the <laughs> hey, best that's gift, a great I've, gift. <laughs> I've ever <laughs> given an, an actor on day one. Um, so you come from writing, like when you're in the room with actors, how did you learn to cast? <laughs> or what's um, your what's your process? You know, I've always been a fan of the craft of acting and you know, I've always had actors that I paid attention to. So I've, I've gotten some sense of process and, you know, just being around it at NYU osmosis, you start to understand in a way what actors are going through and how they find their characters and how they find their moments. And and then, you know, directing short films, you know, you, you start working with actors and you get a sense of, okay, if I just give a line reading, that really annoys them. But if I you know, give them a action verb that gives them a little bit more to jump off of and a little bit more room to play in their own sandbox. Uh, Mickey, what's your what's your take on line readings? You're pretty against them in general, or does it matter? Depend on the situation. I don't mind taking line readings um, because ultimately, I feel most directors will always give you the chance to do what you want to do. But let me get so from my point of view, I'm like, well, let me get what you want. Um, And I come also from a world of voiceover acting where it's very specifically in the intonations and and the punctuation, where you're hitting everything. And sometimes that is really important. So I I don't personally mind if I get line. Yeah, I mean, every every actor is different. And um, but yeah, while people came in, you know, first I would hear their I wouldn't give them any notes. I would just hear what they brought to it. And then. So do you do any like um did they re- they hadn't read the whole script they just no, read the so sides, they, right? they came in with their sides and they did the scene once and then usually if I like them I would give them an adjustment and sometimes they did it the way I imagined it the first time but I'm giving them an adjustment anyway just so that I know they're capable of it because it's you know it's a, a red flag when they can only do it one way because yeah. maybe that way is right on this scene, but if I cast them and we get to a scene where their way isn't right, I know I'm not going to be able to get what I want. So I, I give them an adjustment, and you see how they do with that. And then we taped all the auditions, and I would go back and I'd watch the ones I'd like because sometimes it's different in the room than it is taped, and you have to be aware of that because you're not casting a play. Right. You're casting a movie. And so you wouldn't give adjustments to the people that you weren't into? Maybe at first, but after a while, just because there were so many parts to cast, it was just kind of, I got to get on to the next person. Yeah. Thanks. It's always really depressing to walk into a room and, and only do it once and they don't ask for a redirect. You're like, I sucked. Okay. Well, see, I have a problem that I know that and I just give everyone a second take. Pretty much, yeah. like across the board. Yeah, yeah. I definitely How started does Susan that feel way. About that, Orin? No casting director likes it. The casting directors, I mean, they <laughs> love so, actors, but they're yeah. like, "You're wasting your time and their time." And their time. Yeah, you've got a job. Yeah, but to I me, mean, it's I like they that know way that the, the person the first before. Day. Yeah, the first day I was definitely that way, and then you know, I, you know, you, you just you're in that small room. It's hot, and you're just like, "All right, thanks, thanks yeah. so much for coming in." Sometimes I'll do this thing. It's kind of a dick move, but I'll be like. Hey, how's it going? We're really in a hurry, so you know we're we're just gonna run it once. Okay, ready? And then if they if that, I love that them, that actually is good. If I love them, then I'll have them do it again. But like I'm already like 
pre-setting them up to oh, not yeah. be offended if I don't, we only do it once. The casting associate can help you out with that too. You know, like they can be like, oh, heads up, we're behind, so we're just going to run it once. Don't be, don't feel bad about it. You right. know. Did I tell you, so I just did this spot um, a couple of weeks ago and I had this awesome casting experience. Uh, we cast out of 200 South La Brea. Do you, have you been there, yep. Nikki? It's a huge, it's where LA casting is. Yeah, so they have all these like great, like a really kind of nice office and the casting director I was working with, I would give actors notes. I'd be like, next take, do this. And the next actor that would come in, they'd already have that note. And every time oh, I tried they could to hear give it a through note, the wall. No, because their associates were pre were going out to the waiting room, like, by the way, the director would like for you, for you to do this, or like, come in, let's let's give a, a real fast read, because you know. Um, and I was like, dude, you got you got to stop giving all my notes to the people in the waiting room. You're like, I have nothing to say They're to the actors. It. Well, and this is in a commercial, so like the other like the agency and client are there sometimes as well there's certainly agency sometimes client and so they're kind of like trying to see if you know what you're doing or not so if you're out of ammunition you're like oh man i'm in trouble now yeah but to me it's like it's just like michael said it's like not about what the adjustment is it's just about whether they take i mean i'd say like three out of four times in an audition my adjustments make give make get it worse. to a slightly worse performance oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, i feel um, like that often happens but you just you you want to know that they'll follow you down that rabbit hole. Yeah, <laughs> right. And then I think with the casting, you have to sometimes put your foot down and say, this is the right person. Because, you know, I had my two producers and I had Susan, who's so talented and she knows actors. And my producers are very talented and they've directed their own stuff. They know actors. And there were a lot of people, and Nikki included, who we were unanimous on. Uh, and then there were some actors where we were not. Uh, which makes total sense. Uh, and I had to have the confidence in myself and my own ability to know what I want to say, okay, I can see why you like actor A more for this role, but trust me, what I want to do is more in the wheelhouse of actor B. Right. Did you audition every single character or did you offer anyone? Everyone, like every, all the main characters who are in the film mm-hmm. were auditioned. Yeah. As I was saying about the SAG ULB, like the top like 30 speaking roles had to be SAG actors. But then we had other roles that were like one line or stuff like a, an actress that just came in and like did one line because she's on a date with one of the characters in a montage. And like we did not have the money to pay for all of those people. And so the SAG rules are... If they're an actor, you have to pay them sex. So we hired a lot of non-actors, like like filmmakers or people, like <laughs> friends of mine. Who do they check that? Who and those people? I'm gi- I'm giving a line. Re- See, no. they don't. Sex, the answer is no. <laughs> SAG SAG does not say what qualifies an actor, like what makes someone an actor. So I kind of put my own um, rule for it, where I said if this person has a headshot, they are an actor. If they don't have a headshot, they are not an actor. Uh, So I went out to people who I felt like could deliver a line. And those people I I gave line readings to some of the time. So that's fascinating. You auditioned most of your main characters just because there's a lot of awesome talent, like recognizable people um, coming through the doors. Were there people that you had maybe kept your eye on from TV or or stage or anything like that? Were were there people you were asking to bring in? You know, there were people we went out to earlier on who we never heard back from. Was this before you raised the money? uh, This was kind of in the middle of that. We had, we'd had, we, I had gotten that first investor to come on board. But, you know, I'm a first time director. Who knows if it ever got past their agent or not. So, you know, we started auditioning. And there were people who Susan put in front of us who were offer only. And I need to see that they could do it. You know, the people we reached out to were people who, in other works of theirs, I knew that they could deliver. But we had, like, these girls who were big because they did BuzzFeed videos Mm -hmm. as themselves. But they were kind of quirky 20-somethings. And Susan said to us, hey, you know, this could get us a lot of publicity if you cast them this might be good for us and i said i'll certainly hear them read i need to know that they can act yeah and they were offer only uh and 
you know, maybe I mean, influencers, it, basically. Yeah, right? they were influencers. And, you know, down the road, they could have maybe gotten more eyes on the film by promoting it because they have such a big social media following. But what does it matter if they're promoting, you know, a bad movie because they can't act? And I think some people think that acting is easy, that even when you're just playing a character close to yourself, that it's easy. It's not. It's very difficult just seeming like a normal person in front of the camera. Yeah, I it's can't even to... do it off camera. Well, yeah. we were about to make the same uh, joke, dude. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so it must have been a good joke. <laughs> so I could never just go out on a limb and assume that someone, because they had a lot of Instagram followers, mm -hmm. and would be a good actor. Uh, so, yeah, it was important that we audition all these. There, you know, there was uh, Allison Rich, who has sure. kind of a, a, a smaller role, but an important role in the film. Uh, she, she's someone who I would see at comedy clubs doing her characters. Uh, so I did offer it to her because I just knew that, you know, I don't know if she'll exactly do this role exactly as I've written it, but I know she'll be interesting and I know she'll be funny. And I know because I've seen her in TV shows. Wait, did she have an MTV other show too? She did have an MTV yeah, other show. Right. So we related right. on that level too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, a lot of auditions, uh, you know, just making sure everybody could carry their weight that's awesome i i do have a question just because it's such an actor heavy heavy movie what your set looked like from a production standpoint right so micro budgets on hundred twenty thousand dollars or i guess two hundred thousand but still and like we can all do the math on like oh, 150 bucks a day for all of these actors it's a lot of your budget right what does your team look like what does it feel like there's no motorhomes or dressing rooms or things like that yeah no, none of that um yeah, yeah so what's your bare minimum crew i think like a dozen or so people was bare minimum and then we had as much as like 18 19 20 mm -hmm. on some days because some days we had a lot of extras mm -hmm. so they go to an improv show and we had to have people in the audience uh we had a big party scene so we needed to fill the room up with people who weren't just our actors on those days, we had to have a bigger crew to just accommodate the bigger cast. I mean, it was nearly everyone's first feature on set. And we had a lot of people in the kind of uh, production manager roles and the PA roles who were still in college. We had a lot of uh, people who were studying film at Chapman mm -hmm. uh, who worked on our set. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, it was a very young set. Uh, you know, I think... You know, much to my mother's chagrin uh, in craft services, she, you know, she never wants to be the, the oldest person in any given room. Uh, so I think that frustrated her. It was people who believed in the script. I mean, there would be times where I'd be interviewing two different people for a role and maybe, you know, at a, a crew job. Maybe one person was more experienced than the other but I went with the less experienced person because they seemed to care more. I never wanted to hire someone where I felt like they might feel like they're doing me a favor yeah. by being on the movie. Boy, that, that is sound advice. Yeah. So I always went yeah, with sound people. people who cared and had a passion and who wouldn't mind so much if we went over on one day and wouldn't mind if we had pizza for a third consecutive meal, mm -hmm. though I don't think we actually did that. But you, you get the gist. Yeah, people were happy to, happy to be there and getting yeah. something out of it besides yeah. just... You know, and you know, joking. people were kind of, oh, I, I'm really excited to shoot today's scene because they read ahead <laughs> and they thought it was funny. I mean, like... What's it like it, to have a crew who's read I your know. script, huh? Yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I did short films with, you know, a tenth of the amount of pages where people wouldn't read the whole thing. Yeah, sure. So, oh, yeah. I definitely think that that is key to any low budget project is really getting people that um, have a good attitude to be on set because you are under so many kind of not harsh conditions, but not the best conditions sometimes um, because of budget, you know, where we all might be crammed in a hot space, working longer hours than we want with maybe not as much craft service as we would hope. And <laughs> you're going to want to be around people that won't complain about it, but will say, you know, keep the spirits of everybody up because one bad seed will affect everyone. 
And I know as an actor, you know, being with a crew that's just very gung-ho about the whole thing and having a great attitude, not complaining about what they're doing, really makes me want to continue to work hard and to perform well for them. So we can all go home and, you know, we can get it done. Yeah. Nikki, I have a question for you, actually, because it's not that often that we get to have an actor uh, on the show. I would love to hear, um, and this can be for all kind of low micro-budget um, experiences so not not the big stuff but like the smaller stuff a thing where you're like oh, I'm so glad they, they did this specific detail they nailed something and then maybe something that you've seen that you wish people could improve on just to put you on thing, the spot yeah no one thing in terms that, of production you're asking yeah correct. yeah in terms yeah. of production that um I do feel very grateful for is when they organize the schedule very efficiently Mm -hmm. so that I'm not there in the morning for one scene and then have to wait there the whole day to then shoot the last scene. I think when they're very accommodating of trying to get people in and out, like in a very efficient manner, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it does show your experience or your consideration for our time, especially Mm -hmm. because we are getting paid very little. So the more considerate you are of the time, the, the, the more grateful I am of that. And it it is not something you need a budget for exactly necessarily. You just have to plan well. Do you care, Nikki, about shooting scenes in order? No. Not at all. I mean, I feel like that's your job being a film and TV actor and, and the collaboration of your director is to be able to put you in the place. I mean, it is not theater. So you can't expect it to be that way, that that is how film and TV is shot is completely out of order, you know, and, and it is your director um, and writers who will come and help you put you in your place and remember where you're coming from, what happened before. And I reference or I ask Michael for references all the time. Each time I'm like, so what happened again? You know, just to put me back there. Do you care, Michael, about shooting in order? You know, I think in a perfect world, sure, you'd, you'd love because it would be just a little bit easier um, on everybody in, you know, in their memories. But, you know, I, I think with independent filmmaking, you're never going to be shooting in a perfect world. So, yeah, I mean, that's, it, that's just a challenge that you should be ready to meet while you're, you know, making a movie. Yeah. I, like, love shooting in order, and I feel like ADs are always coming to me, and they're like, well, Nikki's, you know, she's in the first scene, she's in the last scene, but she's not in anything in the middle. Can we just shoot those back to back? I would definitely rather shoot them back to back. And I'll be like, ugh. <laughs> but then like we're going to mess up the room in a certain way and then we're going to have to jump to forward. Yeah. And I think, like, Nikki, what if you just leave? I mean, there are, th- there, are thing, there are things to consider like that continuity. I mean, you know, it's, there's, you know, on a film set when often when you're given two options, it's not as if one of them is easier than the other. They're both just <laughs> right. different types of difficult. That's a good point. Does it help, Nikki, if the director comes over and says, hey, I'm so sorry, this is the way the schedule worked out, but uh, we're going to waste a little bit of your time today? Or does that not? I mean, I I think that that would be nice if it had to be that way. Um, right, showing you that they value your time right. in some way is better than acting like your time doesn't matter. Yeah, and trying just to make the situation as comfortable as possible because especially if you are working with actors who have been on bigger sets, and they they are used to having a trailer and a place to go to to retreat to. But when you're on a low budget film and all you have is a plastic chair, uh, the comparison is a lot harder to to deal with, and you do start to feel somewhat taken advantage of a little bit. Having a director, somebody, anybody, even the AD, you know, to come up to you and just say, "Hey, you know, this is kind of how the schedule's working out. Like, is that going to be okay?" It's rare that any actor is going to, well, I don't know. I yeah. would never say no, sure, you sure. know, but it is considerate. But if you did sense. say no, they'd be like, well, we're sorry. <laughs> but that's yeah, yeah. Anyway. Oh, yeah. I mean, maybe yeah. not even ask, but just yeah, yeah. just say, just hey, I'm up. sorry about that. But just to acknowledge that they tried their best mm-hmm. to make it work out um, and and to understand why. Yeah. Because a lot of times, you know, schedules are made and, and actors actually don't know why it is the way it is. And so to get it and you're like, why would they do that? Mm-hmm. You know, but for someone to explain, hey, it's because this changeover would take this amount of time and it would be really hard for us. So sorry about that. If there's anything we can do to make you feel comfortable in that time or even even the possibility of uh, 
leaving set for, you mm-hmm. know, like if you're going to be on set for 10 hours not doing anything, like if you wanted to leave and come back and we'll call you back four hours before that call time, then, or whatever, you know, sure. just to work out another. Just something to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, did you have, is, is that kind of, it seems like maybe your main room for improvement on indie sets basically kind of boils down to just that level of consideration time consideration yeah. I, I would say that's usually the thing that is hard mm-hmm. um that and food but i i understand that budgets are low mm-hmm. um so personally i usually pack my own food mm-hmm. uh, but i do know that fuel you know is one of the things that really gets a crew by and honestly just having trader joe snacks uh, really boost morale, I think, as mm-hmm. as a whole. And that's a good tip. I feel like Trader Joe's catering, like yeah, crafty, just get some dry is the move. Nuts, some cookies, some crackers, some cheese. Some we we yeah. had the Trader Joe's um, dark chocolate peanut butter cups. I think oh. through the entirety of the. That's I like the peanut butter cups podcast. Uh, yeah, they have real, they're rough on <laughs> audio. Well, awesome. Well, I, I know we talked just so much about casting, you, but yeah, I can kind of quickly go through how we got to here. If you know, if we're, if we're running low on sure, time. sure. You yeah. mean like from making the movie to yeah. so uh, you know, being should, on the yeah, hit, hit podcast? Yeah, we you know, so we shot it in 19 days, and we used our whole budget for mm. production. Mm-hmm. So that meant um, we did a Kickstarter campaign uh, a handful of months after we wrapped. And you hadn't crowdfunded before this? No, we had not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was always the plan that we'd use all our money in production, and that we always felt like it would be easier for us to raise money in post because we'd be able to say, mm-hmm. you know, again, the movie is done. Right. We don't need your money to make the movie. To get we need, started. Yeah, and we need your money. people like Nikki are in it. Yeah. And you can people, cut to a photo of her and then exactly. she can tweet it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we spent a lot of time, you know, on our Kickstarter page and putting GIFs up and, you know, really set it apart. And, you and just won points from Oren for saying GIF. G- no, I mean, I, I prefer GIF, but I know that GIF is the right Oh, word. oh, I misunderstood. I thought you were saying the other way around. I, I prefer GIF as well. Yeah. This is not interesting. I like, I like Sorry. A, I, like a, I like a soft G. <laughs> um, and, you know, because we spent so much time on that, Kickstarter made us their project of the week or oh, something like that. Awesome. Awesome. So we ended up making about 40 grand uh, on, wow. on the Kickstarter. Um, can I ask, in terms of that 40 grand, how many of those donations or patron how much of that money would you say is uh from a first or second degree connection versus strangers? oh like 90 ish percent all of it yeah, but like yeah i mean not to me all mm-hmm. of them oh interesting. so like first second degree connection to my producers first mm-hmm. and second degree connection to some of the actors first and degree and second degree um connections to some of the crew mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so you know they there were a handful of people who I don't know discovered us on the Kickstarter website and threw us twenty five bucks or something like that. But the majority of people knew someone involved mm-hmm. with the film. But that network is so much larger because you've yeah, all got because we made together. the film. Yeah, if we yeah. had done this before, and everyone cares about it. Yeah. yeah, if we had done this before, then it would have been my network and Paul and Rowan's network. Right, and they're kind of already tapped. Right, like that's what got the movie going in the exactly. first place. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So we raised that money. We used that money to edit. Did the you film. edit? Or do you edit? Or uh, do no. So my buddy Jack Horkings did the editing, but I was in the room with him most of the time. Um, premiere? Uh, yep, we did Premiere. Uh, and, you know, we'd edit and then we'd have a test screening mm-hmm. and we'd show a bunch of people and then we'd go back and edit. And we did that again and again and again because, you know, you want to hear where the laughs are. You know, new people in every test screening, right? What? New people in every new test, te- screen. new new people in in most of the test screening. There were some people like who five went, to ten people. Well, we had test screenings of like sixty, seventy people. We Whoa, had, where yeah, we, go, re- buddy. we rented out like the the Sepulveda screening room. Yeah, um, and so I because Jack was my friend, he was able to start editing before we had raised all the money. So we were doing screenings that were both test screenings and. Um, promotions for the kickstarter so mm-hmm. we'd say hey come and watch our work in progress and then at the end we go we're oh, having a kickstarter move. as you notice the sound design wasn't all there if you give your money it'll help us just Ooh, so then they're seeing okay that's this, a plus man that's good stuff yeah so so then so we're both getting comments back you know that are helping me with my editing and also in them 
helping me with my editing and filming out filling out little Q and A cards, mm -hmm. they now feel a little bit invested mm -hmm. in the film. Dude, I think the move is if you want us to take your note, twenty five bucks. <laughs> you think that scene's too long? I'll, I'll shave some frames out. Exactly. Let's pay you for know, it. People want to feel like they have a stake. Oh, I helped with that, and you know right. that gave them that. So, and then that we hired a a composer who composed the original score, and you know all all the stuff. And so we finished the film, uh, like uh, like January twenty twenty eighteen. Okay, and you know, started submitting it. I think we we started submitting it even before we finished it. We we, we submitted to, you know some uh, rougher cuts to you know Sundance and South by Southwest, um, which we had no connections to. We had a connection to Tribeca, and we applied to a grant through Tribeca, which we didn't get. But the person who was the head of programming reached us, out to us personally and was like, we really like your film. We hope you submit. And we were really happy with the film, you know, by the end of it. We were like, we made something, you know, despite all the limitations that we felt like was good. But then we just like did not get into any festivals for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it was... Where'd you guys premiere ultimately? We ended up premiering at the Orlando Film Festival, but it took a long time. And th there was a festival that we had gotten into beforehand, um, like early on in the year. We got into Cinequest, which is a great, oh, yeah. San Jose. Is a great festival. Yeah. Um, That's a great place to premiere. Yeah, it's too. a great festival, but we so thought we were going to get into Tribeca. And mm, it became you got invited. It became things, that yeah. decision, and I reached out to Tribeca, and they said, "Listen, you're still yeah. in contention, but we can't commit to you right now." Yeah. And I had to take that risk. I had to say, "Okay, do I want to go with the sure thing, or do I want to take a risk and try to get, you know, this bigger?" And I, I took the risk, and it didn't pan out, and it was super discouraging when it happened, and I, I felt really low. Um, but looking back on it. I'd make the same decision again just because, you know, I wanted to take the risk. I believed in my film. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it would have been nicer if we had that premiere at Cinequest. It's a, it, it's a bigger film festival than Orlando, um, but it didn't happen that way. So all this time that we're not getting in anywhere. So, like, we got into Cinequest, and then we just, like, didn't get into, like, a ton of places after. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and Cinequest was like the second festival we heard from. So at the time we thought, oh, if we got into the second festival right, we heard right. from, then the yeah. chances are we're going to be getting into Look a bunch. Out. Yeah. Or, yeah, or at least the yeah. other ones on the level of Cinequest. Right. It did not happen that way. Yeah. And I started to get very worried that the film was going to enter the void, uh -huh. as I call it. Sure. You know, that place where people make stuff, some of it good, some of it bad, and then it just disappears into the ether so um someone suggested having a screening here in la where i could invite distributors and all uh you know and anyone you know pr people anyone who i think could drum up interest in the film and also have it double as a premiere for the actors and crew who are in la who haven't seen the movie yet mm -hmm. and have just heard me say we're still waiting on a festival so I reached out to anyone I knew who had made a film and maybe knew some distributors. You know, I went online and tried to find all these emails. I emailed anyone whose email I could get my hand on. And, you know, a chunk of them I didn't hear from. And then a lot of them said, hey, you know, we can't make the screening, but will you send us a link? Mm -hmm. uh, Wait, what did you say in your invite email? We said private screening. So we said we're excited to have a private screening of the browsing effect, which is still in contention at several festivals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's all spin. Sure. Um, and we did have some distributors come. And then at the end of it, we got an offer from Gravitas, who did not come but asked for a screener. And we got another offer from a smaller per, um, distribution company who did come. So it became that decision of, do I go with the big distribution company that has a whole system in place that has name recognition, but who I might be a little bit lower on the priority list? Mm -hmm. Or do I go with someone smaller who doesn't have those things, but they're going to be working on my film every day? And ultimately, we went with the bigger one. You took the risk again. 
Well, I, I felt like... I mean, I guess it's less risky than the festival thing. But. I felt like it was... Well, I felt like both of them were a risk in their own way. I felt that Gravitas was ultimately less of a risk because, yes, we might get lost in their shuffle, but their shuffle is still a well-oiled machine. But yeah, so, you know, I felt like Gravitas was less of a risk, but both of them would be a risk. And, you know, I had decisions like that the entire way where I was weighing one thing over the other and both of them had positives and advantages mm-hmm. and you just you gotta just go okay well i choose you and just not look back <laughs> yeah um so yeah we so we signed with gravitas uh at the end of last year and we went to the orlando film festival and the valley film festival and we won the narrative feature award at the infinity film festival in beverly hills uh and yeah that's and here we are. And here we are. And, and now I'm, your yeah. movie's available for the whole world to see. Yeah, and it you know it, it narrowly escaped um, the void. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and you know it's just I think when you're an independent filmmaker, especially when it's your first film and you're making something for such little money, it's tough to kind of see your film as a real movie out there in the world. I mean. As, as something that exists next to the films that you see on Netflix or wherever. Um, and it's great, you know, that Gravitas, such a reputable company, picked up the film and it just, it adds a layer of validation to it. Um, well, awesome. Well, yeah, we're, guys, this was so great. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for, for having us. us. Um, where can listeners uh, keep track of you, find out more about you? Um, personally, I am active on social media at Nikki Suhu, N I K K I S O O H O O, mainly Instagram. Right uh, I'm on Instagram too, uh, at Fine Dream, F E I N D R E A M. You can see uh, some great pictures of my dog, Archie, uh, and, uh, you know, pictures of me, I guess, oh. sometimes. I'm excited for both. <laughs> um, well, guys, let's hop into unpaid endorsements real fast. Unpaid endorsements. I'm going to endorse uh, two independent films that uh, I caught recently on Amazon Prime. Uh, the first one is Thunder Road by uh, sure, sure. Jim Cummings. Previous G- guest, Jim, Jim, Jim Cummings. Cummings. Uh, yeah. I thought that movie was just so fantastic. And where did you? It's on Amazon Prime? Yeah, I saw it on Amazon Prime a couple weeks ago. Free? Uh, for free, yeah. Hey, okay, free. Jim, I'll watch your movie. Um, I thought it was fantastic. It had kind of a pulse in and of itself. And, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, you're cringing, but you can't exactly look away. Is he the main actor in it? He's the main actor, and he really does a fantastic job acting. Like, sometimes you see, you know, writer, director, actors, and you're like, oh, if you would just cast an actor, your words would sound so much better. Mm -hmm. Um, But he did just a phenomenal job, and I really... I really love the movie. Uh, and the other one is one I actually just watched last night, also on Amazon Prime. Uh, it is a Danish film. It is called The Guilty. Uh, and it, I think it'd be a great movie for any independent filmmaker to watch because it all takes place in one location. And yet it is super suspenseful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it is not boring at all. Uh, it's about a, um, a guy on the Danish police force who's been demoted and now he works for the emergency call center, which um, in which in the film is two one one, not nine one one, and uh, it just unravels over the course of a night, and uh, it's just a super compelling movie that really shows you that you don't need big set pieces to even make a thriller. I mean, I, I made a rom com, which is maybe a little bit more manageable to do well. For a small budget, thrillers are so difficult if you have no budget to thrill people. And this movie totally did that. So uh, The Guilty and Thunder Road, both on Amazon Prime, you can watch them for free. I love the move of just going with like a streaming service a lot of people have too, because it's nice that people can actually just basically for free follow through on those endorsements. Nice, man. Yeah. Um, I have Nikki? something that can be free. Ooh, all right. Uh, so what I wanted to endorse is a little bit more abstract, I guess, in, uh, in abstract. relation to the movie industry. But I think it's perfect for dreamers and creators mm-hmm. and people that need to add a little bit of structure to their lives. Um, so 
what I what I wanted to talk about is one of my most prized possessions, and it's my passion planner. Mm. Uh, it's like a daily agenda, but it acts as a life coach that keeps you accountable to achieving your goals and dreams. So basically, in the beginning of the planner, it has you lay out a kind of... A, vision board? A, yeah, a vision board. Is this an app or a written it, a So paper it's, a, it's a paper planner. But you can actually download it for free, the PDF. So you don't have to buy the actual planner. You can just go on the website, passionplanner.com, and you can download it and just print it out and just do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's great for creatives because a lot of... I've noticed a lot of creative people have all these great ideas um, and these dreams and these goals, but they haven't created a structure or plan to achieve them. And so uh, this planner specifically has you lay out those goals and then helps you break them down into small, actionable, achievable goals, um, smart goals, as you would call them, specific, measurable, achievable. What is the R? Rational? No. 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 I always forget. Reasonable. Relatable. No. Realistic. Realistic yeah. and timely. Yes. Um, and, and then it keeps you accountable every month and every week. It, it makes you focus, like uh, write out what, what your focus is going to be for this month. What is your focus going to be for this week? And what is your focus going to be for this day? And are you working towards this ultimate goal that you're you're shooting for and then every month it it makes you reflect so there's a monthly reflection page and there's questions that ask you like how did you spend your time and how would you do it differently um basically are you working towards this main goal so it keeps you accountable keeps you in check and i've been using it now for five years Whoa. so and literally like i've written financial goals down and exceeded them and it was weird because i I didn't really know how I was going to do that, but exactly. But um, it, it ended up really helping me. Yeah, helps you figure it out. Yeah. That's cool. And it, I heard if you find somebody else's planner, then you can achieve their goals. Is that <laughs> um, I, I guess. But I feel like part of it is having the passion for what you're doing that does keep you going. Like most of us artists know is is that's what pushes us pushes us through that's what keeps us going that would be a good podcast where instead of interviewing people we just read like their how they how they got to where they got to just just their their channels yeah Yeah. i actually can i oh can i plug something else yeah i just finished this book by alex benayon called the third door and it's super fascinating but it's about this kid who uh, wanted to interview like the greats of their industry, Lady Gaga, uh, Bill Gates, you know, but he had no connections or mm-hmm. ins to any of them. And so this book takes you all the all through his journey of the different ways that he went about getting there because he didn't this is have a true story. Yeah, in fiction. he didn't have the connections in and set out way of like, well, you know, figure out how to talk to them, like how to get to their their secretary and then you can talk to them those didn't always work and so he went through all these crazy paths to getting to be able to interview a lot of these people but his story is very inspiring and i think it it really gives people hope um and and motivation to figure out a way there's always a third door he was basically making an analogy to a club and he's like there's the line that you are told that you can wait in and you might get there and then you know there's the vip line where you're privileged and you get in but there's always a third way in and that might mean hopping the fence and going around the security guard and sneaking in through the bathroom so that you get in you know uh, whatever it is, but there is always a third way. My method is you just dress like the guards, and then you go to the club, and you're like, "Hey, I'm back from break." And then they, uh, they ha- have you tried that in real life? I have done that. Um, it doesn't really work. I don't know if that would work at like. <laughs> I I honestly cannot even name a cool club. That's how cool I am. <laughs> um, but uh, but I do know that it works. Like at a, um, I grew up in Orange County, and they have the Irvine Spectrum, which was like this giant uh, amphitheater where you, they like. All these giant bands, sure, sure. Like Ariana Grande or whatever. And you could, if you wore like khakis, black t-shirt, black shoes, and you'd come like half an hour after the concert started and you're like, hey, I'm back from break. They'll be like, cool, come on in. Because people <laughs> take a break 30 minutes into the concert. No, because, well, if you were there like two hours before, like setting up yeah, or yeah. cleaning yeah, up yeah. or whatever. Yeah. 
Um, and so did you, you ever actually do that? Yeah, I saw Blink One Eighty Two. I saw <laughs> Britney Spears. I mean, this was a very long time ago. <laughs> That's um, awesome. <laughs> wearing khakis and a black T-shirt. Yeah, because That's great. Well, I knew about it because they would like hire these different like high school groups and youth groups to like volunteer to help, and mm-hmm. they would tell you like, oh, just show up. Yeah, they I was tell gonna you how say, to get do in. you really look like a typical bouncer? <laughs> You know, uh, not in this country. <laughs> There's some places where people are really scared of me. Um, that's awesome. Well, the third door. I'm gonna I'm gonna buy that book. Yeah. I'm gonna read it. Yeah, it's really great on Audible because you can hear him say it uh, mm-hmm. himself. That's cool. And and then you can hear his enthusiasm. But the type of people that he ends up meeting and the people that help him along his journey, I think, is very inspiring. Like one of the greatest lessons that I got out of the book is tell people what you want. You know, tell people yeah. your goal and your dream, and you'd be surprised how many people are willing to help you when they see how passionate you are about it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Good. That's so that's funny because I remember uh, I was really into Bob Dylan when I was in high school. I'm still into Bob Dylan, but I remember uh, a quote of his, reading a quote of his in high school, which was, don't tell anyone else your dreams because they might steal them. Uh, that does seem like something he would say. <laughs> Yeah, but they're not going to have the passion that yeah. that fires them to keep pushing through. I think that's honestly. No, I, I, I think I think the third door is probably right. I just I just remember <laughs> sure. yeah. I just remember that quote, and then whenever I would tell someone I want to be a filmmaker, I would think, oh, I shouldn't have done nah. that. They might steal it. And Bob would be so <laughs> mad at me. Right now. I, I heard like you know that's the definition of passion though. Passion is not what you want because people all want pretty much similar things. They want to be fit. They want to have a lot of money and be entrepreneurs and get to make their own schedule. But it's what are you willing to sacrifice for? What are you willing to push through when things are hard? And those are your true passions. Yeah. I feel like in in filmmaking specifically, like there is that I want to be a filmmaker versus I am a filmmaker. And I'm sure in acting, it's the same thing. And oh, like, yeah. Taking that leap is like that's the really part. hard part. Um, well, cool. Well, I'll give two really quick ones. Number one, do you guys watch the OA on Netflix? I watched the first. I watched the first season. I haven't watched the second yet. I feel like it had really mixed reviews, but I loved the first season. And I, like I just, it too. I just watched like the first four episodes of the second season, and it's like a whole new it's joyride. A, it's a totally bonkers, right? Did you watch it? No, but I've seen. I watched the trailer, and I was like, oh, I thought I knew what the show was about, and I don't. Apparently, they reinvented. I, you know, and I don't know if I've talked about this much on the podcast, but I tend to hate season two of every show, especially <laughs> the great shows like the Mr. Robots. The well, that's Detectives. good because I only did season one and missed 2059. Hey, hey, hey. Not going to talk about that. <laughs> too, but uh, but um, but in general, when you do even like girls or some show where you're like, this show just changed everything. And then you watch season two and you're like, now they didn't change everything. So, sometimes season two is when it's at its best. Yeah. Though. House. I mean, House of Cards, I know. 30 Rock, I would say if their season, second season is even better. Yeah, I guess the Thirty Rock or even a Kimmy Schmidt or Sometimes something. they have to hit Modern their stride, Family. I guess, yeah, I think say. more often than not, comedies are are better season two because mm-hmm. the writers have uh, had a whole season to kind of mesh with they the actors' the voices right. and the comedic yeah, yeah, voices, while to... dramas have a tough time because they're putting all the kind of dramatic engine in the first mm-hmm. season, and it's like, oh, what do we do now? Right. Well, you know. There's no real dramatic engine to a first season of right. a comedy. It's well, just also, it's the characters. It's it's episodic shows, yeah. right, where you can kind of tune in whenever versus like Handmaid's Tale, which is like so earth shattering in the first season and the second season you're like, they're just torturing people. And I'm yeah, not I really did not like the yeah. second season. But I, honestly, I didn't. I don't feel this chasm exists any deeper than in Westworld. <laughs> I thought the first season was really cool and I thought the second season was nearly unwatchable. Yeah, well, I... Didn't watch the second season, so I guess you're right. Um, the, whole, the whole time you're like, oh, this is really confusing, but it must be confusing on purpose because they're going to explain it all in the last episode, and you get the last episode like, no, it's just, it's just poorly put it's together. Just unclear. Yeah, Mr. Robot, has, it's not that bad, but also similar things. But the OA, it's kind of a whole new show, but it is about the same things and with the same characters and, and a bunch of new ones. So I'm really enjoying it. And also I just, this morning, so I had to shoot today, and I've heard that other people like listen to our podcast on their way to shoots. So I was like, did I you do it? I don't listen to our podcast, oh, but I listened I to kidding. Jordan Brady's podcast, the respected okay. process. And he was interviewing this other director, Ben Plummer, who uh-huh. yeah. Friend obviously of the show. we were yeah. fans of because he plugged our podcast a bunch of time. And he's, he's a talented director also, but they were talking about that. Like once you start getting paid to direct, 
it's really hard to like keep the hustle up, like how lazy you become when all of a sudden you have to get your own permits and find your own locations and do your own SAG contracts and all that stuff. Um, and I just, I don't know, I appreciated the con- that conversation because I feel like it's something a lot of people, even like you and I, don't talk that much on the mic about like how lazy we are. Yeah, you just feel like, you well, know? I'm happy yeah, I'm making money. But Let's it, watch season two of the OA. Yeah, but you were not making yeah. like passion projects, you know, yeah. or well, things that we, you know, are. Yeah. Should be hustling harder. Yeah. Right? Well, I'll, we'll have to check that episode out. Uh, I've got two quick things super fast. One actually is on behalf of our producer, Madeline Rosewatt, who texted us uh, a podcast episode called uh, Networking for People Who Hate Networking. It's part of uh, the show Work Life with Adam Grant. It's a TED podcast, uh, but it's all about basically making work suck less. And it's a lot of pretty entertaining like tips and ideas about uh, networking. And I thought it was really great because I think it's something that I think we talk a lot about on the show. It's a bar- part of the whole thing of being in showbiz. Um, but it's about basically how to be effective in basically building relationships, which is really what you're talking about when you're saying networking. It's not like how many business cards can you trade with other people in a cocktail mixer. It's like, how can you be of service to other people? And, you know, why would they would want to be there for you when you need their help, basically. So uh, networking for people who hate networking is the episode. It'll be in the show notes. And then um, my endorsement is inspired by you, Michael. I'm going to say Last Days of Disco is the ultimate with Stillman movie a great film a great film and uh, I would say superior to, to uh, Metropolitan I, I I would agree with you um, but you know Metropolitan was made on a much smaller budget oh, okay. and it was a, a lot closer to you know the kind of feel that I felt felt like I could attain fair enough from my movie which was not a period piece nor right. did we have a big uh, disco that we could uh, all shoot at but <laughs> sure. I love Whit Stillman I've seen all of his films and uh, that that's probably my my favorite. Well, well, listeners, let us know what you feel about the OA and what is your favorite Whit Stillman movie. <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen exactly zero Whit Stillman movies. I wonder if you would like him. I'm, I'll check him out. Well, you should give Metropolitan and Last Days of Disco a shot. I think they're both great examples of movies about young people in a specific period of their time kind of just talking, right? But yeah. Somehow it's incredible. I mean, you know, I think there's certain people who just like listening to mm-hmm. well thought out words yeah you know and Whit Stillman you know is kind of a you know a novelist right kind of in and in, in the care he gives to his dialogue and it's just you know even though nothing really of consequence really ever really happens in his films it's exciting if you're big into dialogue yeah. if you lock in yeah Cool. Well, guys, this was so great. You can follow me at Mr. Matt Enloe or an at Smitey Pilig on Twitter and O. Kaplan on Instagram. This episode was produced by Madeline Rose Watt and our webmaster is Ewan Williams. And the music you're listening to is from the Free Music Archive and the artist Gizard. And if you can leave us an iTunes review, that would be awesome. More to come on that. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.